Just before my 12th birthday, I was diagnosed with the incurable bowel disease known as Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease can affect from your mouth to your backside. And I was diagnosed right at the join between the small bowel and the, the large bowel. And then at 14, I had my first surgery. If you imagine your intestine as a hose pipe, it's, it's several meters long and they cut out the section that's no good and stick the two hose pipes together. I had 25 further surgeries. My bowel ended up at 40 centimeters. It just been chopped away, disease, disease. And I reached the point of intestinal failure. Your body can't absorb uh, what you put into it. They said to me, look, your bowel isn't gonna recover. You're gonna need a bowel transplant. And one of the big things I knew from my transplant was that I was gonna have a, an ostomy. Uh, I was gonna have a bag attached to my body. And one of my earliest recollections is waking up feeling this bag, this alien thing attached to my body. And I got used to the bag, but having a bag is a challenge because what they do as part of surgery is they cut your nerve endings. Here, you've got a hole effectively halfway through your intestine. Your waste is collected into a bag and you don't know when, what, when it's gonna come out. So it fills very quickly. So you experience leaks and spills and those things are challenging. And not only that, your doctors wanna know how much is coming out. So you're basically asked to measure your own shit. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. What do you do to cope? And they're like, just get used to it. And so I was looking at this bag and going, okay, well, every time there's output, it, it expands, it changes shape. Surely if I could know when it's gonna change shape, I could send a signal, I could happily figure it out. And I had some help with some friends, because I'm not an engineer, and we bought some gear on eBay and, and hacked a sensor. I would sellotape it onto my bag and, and walk at home and then take it into the hospital and go, look, my bag's beeping. And my doctors were like, that's great for you, but it doesn't help me. We still need to know how much shit is coming out. And when it's coming out, you've got to be able to figure it out. What struck me at the time was people building all these solutions in healthcare. They're giving you all these things, whether it be drugs, whether it be technologies, whether it be bandages, whatever it may be. But they're giving it to you rather than building it with you. And here I am as the end user. I understand the problem better than anyone else, better than any nurse. If I want to know how to solve a problem, I'll go to another patient. So I started building uh, Eleven Health just as a way of helping other people, hacking our health. I used social media. I'd really got going on social media in the build-up to transplant. And the phone calls and the texts, as, as beautiful as they are, are endless. And I just started a blog. And the blog was really a way of saying, this is what's going on, and I was really transparent. And what I didn't realize is that my healthcare team were reading the blog as well and then they were passing it on to medical students. And at some point, you know, 100,000 people were reading this blog from around the world, just going, this is what it's like to experience a transplant. And I have a WhatsApp group with my surgeon in, who's now in India, the surgeon that took over in the UK, nurse, and we speak almost daily. And they are part of my life. And they're like my second family. We had, we had two guilty pleasures of going through transplant. One, um, Jeremy Kyle. I'm not sure it's a guilty pleasure. And Strictly Come Dancing, which is again, the UK version of Dancing with Stars. And it's always every day, different blood tests, different blood tests, and nurses would always time it around Jeremy Kyle so we could watch another story live on TV um, because it kind of took you out of your experience. And then at the time when I was in hospital, there was a quite a cool guy who was hoping to win Strictly Come Dancing and all the nurses would come in and go, I've got to see this guy dance, I've got to see him. And I think what's important is that you treat them with the same respect you want back. My surgeon said to me a phrase that is, is very well used, you know, yesterday's gone and tomorrow hasn't happened to live today. And just, you know, you've now had the gift of another life, go live it. And I'm very lucky we built this relationship, um, really just based on the trust, empathy together. And, and fundamentally, I think that's at the heart of healthcare. That, doctor-patient, healthcare professional patient relationship, for me, is, is what underpins. You can have all the best technology in the world, you can have all the best systems in the world, but it's that human-to-human -human connection that, for me, is most powerful. My name's Jerry Hickson, and I'm just honored to be here today for the World Patient Safety Science and Technology Summit. And I want to welcome you to uh, the third session, 
which is about patient advocacy. And I love this title, The Compass for Innovation. Now, again, I said, my name is Jerry Hickson. I'm a pediatrician by training, but for years it was the Senior Vice President for Quality Safety and Risk Prevention at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, was a researcher, and my research career focused on if we just listen to patients and families, they can tell us about our dysfunctional systems where we make it hard to get the right thing done. They also can help us identify those team members, those medical team members, that don't play well with others that get in the way of safety. And so I've learned uh, in lots of studies and in real world settings that it's all about listening to your colleagues and respecting your colleagues. And so I wanna thank you for being here and want you to know how important I think advocacy is. I also uh, just have told you and will tell you again, we have a great panel. But before we get into introducing our great panel, uh, I hope you had a chance to view Michael's video. If you haven't, please do so. I've watched it four times. And every time I've watched it, I have picked, on, picked up on some other things that are incredibly important at this individual who was committed and worked hard to promote change. And I think really he's written a game plan for how you get that done. And I also uh, was struck by the fact that in spite of all the things that he's faced, he modeled respect for everyone, and he modeled a sense of humor. Those things are really important. So today, we have three panelists who also have made significant contributions. And I have known Sue Sheridan for a number of years as a pediatrician. She focused on an issue that was near and dear uh, to my heart. And Sue, uh, briefly introduce yourself at this moment, and then we'll introduce others. And then I'm going to have some questions for you. Sue, who are you? Great. Oh, thank you, Jerry. Who am I? Um, uh, what, most importantly, I am, I come from the patient community. Um, my family had two extensive uh, medical heirs um, that launched me into patient safety. My patient safety career is one that I've been an advocate. I've been part of a nonprofit of mothers. I worked at Bacori for six years as the director of patient family engagement. I worked at CMS and in, in engaging patients in policymaking. I led a program at the WHO on, again, engaging patients in innovation and driving safer healthcare. I'm currently a co-founder of Patients for Patient Safety US that's focusing on re-energizing patient safety in the United States. It's, it's an umbrella of uh, a program at the WHO. Pleased to be here. I'm glad you're here and I'm also glad uh, Susanna Lorenzo is a distinguished colleague from Spain who is joining us today. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, thank you for the invitation. Sorry for my uh, English, but it is not my mother tongue. So I'll do what I'm as much as I can. My name is Susana Lorenzo. I work at Hospital Universitario Fundación, Al Al Fundación Alcorcón. Yeah, I'll go back. Mm -hmm. My name is Susana Lorenzo. I work at Hospital Universitario Fundación Alcorcón uh, near Madrid. And um, there I am the uh, manager of quality and patient safety at the hospital. I take care of uh, patient health and uh, patient management at the hospital. I am also the CEO of the Journal for Healthcare Quality Research. And thank you for being here. I'm, I'm so uh, upset that this is not in San Francisco. <laughs> Susanna, we just, we're glad to be able to participate with you any way we can, and we will continue to have opportunities. Thank you. Carol, Carol Moss, tell us who you are. Well, I am happy to be here. First of all, I'm honored. Uh, I am here today in honor of my son, Niall Calvin Moss. And uh, I, I share the view of hope and I share uh, the stories of success that we've had in finding ways to make healthcare safer. Um, as a mother, a wife, and founder of Niles Project, we are a patient safety, uh, we are the voice of the patient. Our goal is to be at every table that's making decisions uh, for the world. And so I'm honored to be here and I look forward to a lively conversation today. You know, I'm looking forward to that. And thank you for introducing yourselves. And I'm, as I warned her, I'm going to turn to Sue first. 
Sue, I want you to share with us about your personal story, how you've moved forward those things that I know you have gotten done. So if you would lead out and uh, we'll uh, get started and then I have some additional questions that we'll follow up with everybody at the right time. Sure, I'm happy to kick this off, Jerry. Um, so what brings me here? You know, what brings me here is really what I'm gonna talk about today is my son, Cal. And um, Cal was born in 1995 in a large regional hospital. Um, he was perfect at birth, but because of a series of, a cascading series of failures in our healthcare system, Cal fell through the cracks several times um, and he suffered permanent brain damage when he was only five days old from the failure to test and treat his newborn jaundice, from the fear of nurses to speak up when they didn't agree with the pediatrician, from the failure of oversight of residents, um, actually from guidelines, um, the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines on Jaundice Management that weren't really as safe as they could be. And also the failure to really educate patients and families. The parent education materials for me said nothing about dangers of jaundice. Um, so, you know, my husband and I, my late husband and I watched our son suffer brain damage in the hospital and in our arms and before our eyes. And I, you know, I'm sure all the viewers can understand how devastating that is. And, you know, I learned that there was, I couldn't, you know, erase history. I couldn't turn back the clock, but I decided that I did want to be part of making sure that didn't happen to any other babies or any other parents. So I started writing letters and I wrote letters to our government, to the AAP, to the American Hospital Association, to everybody I could think of. And eventually I was invited to testify in Washington, DC in 2000. There was a lot of media about it and other mothers saw me and they connected with me and said, their child suffered brain damage from newborn jaundice as well. And it was because our children weren't getting the dollar test. The AAP guidelines were not clear about it. There was no universal test for a bilirubin that all babies should have. It was considered routine, but then in the 1990s, it started to kind of fall off. So we all, we all realized that a dollar test and maybe better parent education materials could have changed the outcome of our children. So we approached our healthcare system. We decided to partner with the very healthcare system that failed our newborns and failed us. Um, so we approached the Joint Commission, the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, nursing organizations, NIH, HRQ, our government. Um, we had 17 partners at the end of our, you know, end of our work. And we did all agree to work together on preventing the, you know, this from happening from other babies. Notably, you know, the AAP who really establishes the guidelines that are implemented in all of our hospitals, not only in the United States, but in many other hospitals around the world, they really look at AAP as, you know, as a, as a, a leader. And we work with the AAP to revise their guidelines um, to include a universal bilirubin test for all babies before they're discharged. Now, this was not an easy task at first because this started in 2000 when we moms presented to the AAP our idea about including uh, newborn, newborn jaundice testing as a universal test. And at first they shared with us that, well, honestly, they called me Pollyanna at first. And I think that's what it takes, you know, to have all this hope. And uh, maybe I was a Pollyanna, but, we continued working together for years. Now that was in 2000, today is 2022. We are still working together. And so we successfully, through a long process, changed those guidelines to include universal bilirubin test. We also changed their parent education materials that beforehand did not say anything about the dangers of jaundice. Matter of fact, the AAP parent education material said, don't worry, jaundice is normal. So we ensured that they included information that jaundice can, in rare cases, cause brain damage, that moms and dads need to be part of the, you know, the uh, extra eyes to prevent this harm. 
So fast forward to today, in, in 2022, we are still working with the AAP. It's, we have a very good relationship. We are now revising the guidelines again, and mothers are engaged as partners in revising the guidelines. And we have offered um, significant changes to the guidelines that were, were at first proposed by the pediatricians. And right now we're in the middle of reviewing and revising the parent education materials. So the lesson of that whole, you know, it's been a 22 year relationship is at first it was difficult because this was new territory. And now it's getting ingrained the AAP and other agencies who are, are innovating and working with patients to really drive change. So as a pediatrician, I want to affirm that change is real. Slow, Absolutely. but it's real. Absolutely. And as we come back in a minute, and I'm going to ask you to reflect on some key things that made a difference. Yep. Your tenacity has been one of those, and tenacity with a smile, but we'll talk a little bit about that. But thank you for sharing and what you've done. Absolutely. Now, Susanna, I want to ask you to share story, <laughs> thoughts, um, about I patients, been, advocates, and please share with I us. I have been thinking about how I could participate in the in this um, meeting, and I thought that it, the most in, the most interesting thing that I can share is the change in the in the um, culture in the Spanish uh, healthcare uh, that we started uh, like uh, ten years ago with a project on uh, second victims. Uh, as you know, uh, the second victim is the health uh, care professional that is involved in a um, near miss or incident uh, or a preventable uh, adverse event. Uh, those, those people uh, uh, that are involved in the adverse event afterwards are uh, overwhelmed uh, with, the, with the incident. Uh, it, it happens to nurses, physicians, and everybody else around when one of those things happens. And um, in the Spanish healthcare, there was no initiative on, uh, um, going on. So we decided to um, um, ask for a, a grant uh, for the, through the Spanish Ministry of Health and we got the grant. So we had to develop that. We used uh, all the information that uh, the Young Hopkins, uh, Albert Wu and Susan Scott at uh, Wisconsin, I think it's Wisconsin, University, uh, we use all that information and we started changing. Um, it, it has, uh, we have a few materials that you can find in the, in the website uh, that you can, uh, in Spanish and in English that uh, people are using. Uh, but I think that the most important thing in, in our case is that the hospitals like or the one where I work at, uh, at this point have their own uh, pro protocols. We have procedures when there's an event, adverse event, we follow it. We talk to the patients, we talk to the families and we go on because this, uh, unfortunately, as uh, Sue was saying, these things happen, but we had to go over them. Since, I, since my, my, um, my working quality has been uh, my major uh, for the, since I finished at the University of Michigan a long time ago, um, I thought uh, that this was the way of putting uh, the things in practice. Since I was not only the quality man manager saying blah, 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 but uh, uh, going uh, with those professionals and working with them. At this point, um, during the COVID uh, pandemic, we uh, went again with the project and we have been uh, giving support to all those professionals uh, at the Spanish hospitals with uh, uh, um, a, a website and some materials to support them. And I think that uh, it has been really uh, helpful for um, most of them. So I think that the professionals involved in um, in the adverse events or even the near misses are uh, something that we should keep in mind uh, all the time. Susanna, I just wanna commend you about the issues of looking at things that don't go well and understanding how many responsibilities 
we have to understand, to engage with patients and families, their advocates, and work to make medicine kinder and safer. And this is work in action. And thank you for your willingness uh, to share. Now, at this particular point, uh, I am going to turn to Carol. Uh, and Carol, if you could share with us today, because you have so many observations and experiences that we need to hear about. Absolutely. I'd be honored to. I think the message I want to get through today is that making healthcare safer is possible. Change can happen with a single person that begins if you have the will. Uh, I'm happy to say that we turned a tragedy into a mission, a coalition of patient safety advocates, a coalition of friends of our family. And we did this because we suffered a tragedy that we couldn't believe that happened. Um, so why we're here and why we are talking today is, is because of a, a strange thing that happened. We were busy, our family traveling, enjoying life, having our jobs. Um, my husband, Ty, my son, Niall, and I, we lived a great life um, for 15 years. And I, we're really thankful for that. When Niall was born, he had hydrocephalus. He had water on the brain and um, he overcame that. At six weeks, we found these challenges. Uh, we had a great neurosurgeon that, that you know, um, took care of his aqueduct stenosis, which meant that he had uh, a piece of skin in the wrong place in his brain that caused hydrocephalus. So he had a shunt. And this uh, very creative doctor found a way to pile in enough tubing in the shunt that he, he didn't have a revision for nine years. So a five pound baby uh, stretched out to the length of a, a 10 year old boy. And because of the care that this surgeon took, uh, we weren't in the hospital off and on revising his work. And so we overcame that. And uh, many times people will know that along with these things, uh, you find a way to live your life fully, even though you're having neurosurgeries or you're having strabismus surgeries or you're having whatever you're doing. We were really frequent flyers of the healthcare system. Uh, we're located in California and um, we did this in a way that we would always reserve energy for an emergency that we had to go take care of. And then we would just live our life. So for um, in 2006, we had moved to the hills and Niall had a great course and we found a way to live in the country. And it was five years since he had had a procedure, but every year Niall went to the top children's hospital to have an MRI and a series of tests just to make sure that that growth had not grown. So he has an MRI. So uh, this time in 2006, Niall went uh, to the top hospital in Orange County, the top children's hospital. And he had an MRI and we returned. And a couple of days later, he had flu-like symptoms. And I just, you know, as one, that's very strange. Let's go have this checked out. So we went to the pediatric physician and I said, we were just in the hospital. This is in 2006. Um, it's just a couple of days. He has flu-like symptoms. He's wheezing. He has a hard time breathing. Um, he has a headache. Um, the signs were very similar to COVID. And at the time there was no COVID, but I'm relating it to what people are feeling today and seeing today. So um, they took a strep test. They said, nope, don't have strep throat. And they wrote out a prescription and handed it to me. It said, go get the prescription for this antibiotic and he should be fine. Uh, little did I know that when I was sitting in that pharmacy um, for two hours waiting for a useless prescription, that that would be the last time I would be in public with my son. Um, this is now April 15th, 
and uh, 2006 and Niall was getting worse. He was having a hard time breathing. So we rushed him down to the hospital and where it took uh, almost 15 hours to finally get him admitted, to finally give him the first drops of antibiotics and the delay, the delay, the delay, even with the films that showed he was having necrotizing pneumonia, the delay, the delay in antibiotics, the delay of treatment caused my son to die. We could not believe this. We could not believe the day after Easter in 2006 that our son was not going to be coming home with us. And um, it was the most horrific day of our lives. And three days later, we received a call from the physician on charge. And he said, well, we got a test back because we took a MRSA test um, and we got a test back and your son had, had MRSA methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus. And I said, what is that? And they said, oh, it's, it's a staph infection. He had a staph infection and, and that's, that's all we can say, we don't know anything else. So uh, in shock and, and not knowing what to do, I went to Google and I typed in methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus and two things popped up. Cephed rapid test, two hours, results in two hours and the stop hospital infection campaign from a woman by the name of Lisa McGifford. And she worked for the consumer union, which was a part of consumer reports. They not only tested toasters, but they also tested the quality of hospitals and reported on it. And this was a campaign stop hospital infections to make a long story short. We got very, um, uh, very engaged with the Stop Hospital Infection campaign. And Lisa McGifford began to teach me and educate me and provide a PhD um, in the area of what is really going on in hospitals that we're not aware of. And what we learned was we were unaware of the war of preventable hospital acquired infections raging in our hospitals in the US and throughout the world, we were unaware of the number of people that die from preventable infections. And in Niall's case, we were unaware of the number of people that die from sepsis because what happened was, was the same thing that happens to over 250,000 Americans every year. And that is uh, the physicians did not take Niall's signs of sepsis seriously. And because of the delay, the delay, the delay, and the uh, lack of antibiotic, proper antibiotic treatment, Niall's life ended. So this was horrific. Sue and every other mother in the world, especially the people today in Ukraine who are losing their, the lives of their loved ones, and they realize what it's like to be in a war, that's what we felt like. When we finally, I made nine appointments at the CDC. I said, I need to know why. Why are you not educating the public? And what I wanna share is that the success of new information getting out in the public is huge. Uh, we work very closely with the CDC because we started to take other stories and share their stories with the CDC and urge them to please educate the public. We were unaware, we were unprepared. So today, um, after forming an organization called Niles Project, we are a public health patient safety awareness organization. We do public outreach concerts and events to educate the public on real preventable measures. We get the information from the scientists we uh, found out why we had no idea of how many people go into hospitals and get these infections. So we said, let's find out what state has laws that require hospitals to report their infection rate. Let's find out what states require screening at the door so that you can properly test people as they come in to find out, do they have MRSA or do they have other infectious diseases? Will they be spreading it to uh, our patients? Will they be spreading it to our 
healthcare workers. So we uh, implemented and we work diligently on legislation for the state of California that today saves lives because of awareness. And in the state of California, all hospitals have to report their infection rate. Um, these are positive things that happen when a single person or family finds the experts, gets the science, and finds a way to make change for other people. And I just want to make sure uh, there's so many things that we've done and so many things that others are doing today. The Patient Safety Movement Foundation has been a wonderful organization to work with because they do respect and honor the patients. And we have a place at the table, which is how we need to change this in our world to make sure that families and those who have been affected by preventable medical harm have a seat at the table. Carol, thank you for sharing this notion about the need for a seat at the table. And they don't always come easy. But one of the things that I want those in attendance either today or who viewed this later to pause and think about of these stories that we've heard, what are the two or three things that were most important? A lot of people have great ideas and we want to be thankful for those great ideas, but to take a great idea and to promote change requires more than just a good idea. Sue, when you think back about Michael's presentation, your comments, Susanna's comments, Carol's comments, what two or three things really stand out to you that make a difference that you'd have those who are thinking about how can I help? Right. You know, I think that especially from, you know, my personal experience in engaging in innovation and change and patient safety with the healthcare system, you know, you mentioned that, you know, we were tenacious, the moms were tenacious and we stuck with it and, and we, we, were, we were moms on a mission. But you know, what really mattered most were the humble leaders that were willing to listen to us and to partner with us and step into a new paradigm where it just wasn't about science and policy and academia. They recognized that we weren't gonna get to safety without the passion, the knowledge, the experience, experience and advocacy of the patient community. So I think that was the biggest lever that I saw, and I continue to see 22 years later, are individuals willing to step into this new paradigm. They're courageous, they're humble, they're forward thinking. They don't, they're not too concerned about what their peers think. You know, they're they're, they're out in front, you know, making change. So I think that was one of, one of the biggest uh, facilitators, let's say of engaging with patients in innovation. Sue, I like that a lot. Professionals, real professionals. Right, are right. Are self-reflective. They pause and ask, am I a part of the problem? Am I a part of the solution? And have I really thought about it? And who are the voices out there that I need to listen to? That's right. Sue, what else would you add? Yeah. And, you know, can I just say something else? Um, you know, it was... Um, it was an interesting journey to, to work with healthcare professionals because we moms, when we approach them, we recognize that a lot of the clinicians, when we talked about change, only saw the barriers. They talked about, oh, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. We can't work with the Joint Commission. We can't call CD, CDC. And we're like, yes, you can. And, and so what we saw as non-professionals, we didn't know the barriers in the healthcare system. We only saw opportunities. Right. And so that's what I hope viewers of this session recognize. Yes, there are barriers out there, but you can overcome those barriers when you, when you band together under a mission and a purpose that's really meaningful. And it is that collaboration. Susanna, what would you add? What have you heard uh, in this session today from any of these presentations that strike you as a key to success? I think that the trick, uh, I think it was Susan who said that it was tenants because you, once you start, you have to keep going. Whatever happens, whatever you talk to 
whomever would find all the barriers. No, you should keep going. You have your objective and, and, and go, keep going. That means that you need a multidisciplinary team. And in that team, we want patients and we want patients uh, advo advo advocate, advocates, oh, sorry. Um, we, we as uh, I thought it, it was Carol who said that we have the will, we have it. But then now we need to, to put it in practice and to sit all of them at the same table. When I meet with, the, with patients and with uh, their families in different meetings or doing surveys at the hospital or conducting uh, studies, uh, people is willing to help our, us health professionals. So let's start talking and making, uh, changing the culture. That's I, what I think we need. Susanna, this notion of collaboration, though, is sometimes frightening. Yes, I And know. one of the things that I see modeled in this group, what I heard on Michael's video is, and that's why I go back to Michael's humor. It's a frightening thing. And when collaboration among a multidisciplinary group has not been the common, getting people to relax enough that they listen and reflect is a key and I've heard that with all of you. It does take tenacity, but it takes a sense of humor. It takes a vision. And all of you have modeled that. Carol, what else would you add is, is one of your keys to success? Well, I think um, you need to make it personal. You need to always connect with those who have the connections and you need to make it personal. Uh, I'll give you an example. So when we started to work on this legislation, I called Governor Jerry Brown at the time in California, the governor of California. And I said, I need to talk to the head of who is running the health department here. And they put me in touch with the head of the person running the health department. And uh, we made an appointment. She called and she said, you know, my aide is going to be able to get more things done for you. You need to talk to Jennifer. So when I talked to Jennifer, she... Uh, I'll have to correct that. It was Governor Schwarzenegger, who was the governor at the time, and she was reporting directly to the governor. And I said, what I need to do is I need to find a senator that has actually had Governor Schwarzenegger sign a bill into law that will fine hospitals for mistakes or fine a hospital for something. And they said, there's only one. Her name is Elaine and um, there's only one. And she said, but I will tell you right now, you're never gonna get this through. You're never gonna get public reporting. It's never gonna happen. I go, okay, that's right. I'll just give Elaine Alquest a call. And I kept in touch with that Jennifer. We found out that Niall's birthday was the same birthday. We got together and had ice cream on their birthday. We, I kept in touch when I saw things going crazy. So make it personal and timing. Timing was of the essence. Timing was there were big problems going on in California with healthcare. Um, at the time, the governor's medical, his wife's medical records had been breached and he was not happy about that. So the timing was perfect to start making sure that hospitals were being held accountable for things that should not happen. So I think make it personal and timing. Carol, thank you for that. Uh, uh, briefly, but I do not want to miss this opportunity. Who heard something in this last round that you just want to call out or emphasize? Uh, raise your hand. We'll do it in that informal, uh, non-electronic way. Did you hear anything that you would like to call out again? Sue, I see your hand moving. That oh, came. Wow. No, I was just moving my head. I know, I'm just trying to think. I think everybody's brought up such good points. Um, and that, you know, I, I think what I like, uh, Carol and Suzanne, I think brought this up, is the message to those who are viewing this, this session, this panel, is, um, you know, really to acknowledge that, again, uh, science and technical expertise and academia alone cannot really solve our patient safety problem. That it must engage the lived experience, the knowledge, the wisdom, the passion, the advocacy 
of the patient communities. And so I want listeners to think about how can they invite us to their boardrooms, to their committees, to their guideline development table, to their, you know, all of their patient safety improvement efforts to really accelerate and transform patient safety. Sue, thank you for that. And I saw Susanna's hand. Susanna, what would you add? I think I think that uh, professionals, if the professionals involved, but also the patients and their families involved, uh, need to be, be heard and understood of what was going on and to participate in the definition of the measures to be implemented after to prevent it happen again. I think that that is probably the, the key uh, to, to um, change uh, things because they would see that after an adverse event, things change so that it won't happen again. And they would be involved uh, next time, more and more involved. You know, Suzanne, it is so important. When I sat as a family member in a patient's room who had had some knee transplants and I suddenly realized what a terrible job we did in washing our dang hands. It is that passion to improve things that we see. So I wanna remind those who are listening today, it's not, it, the policy works incredibly important. Collaboration is incredibly important. Sitting in a patient's room and making observations is incredibly important. And we need to be actively engaged in those things. Now, we have just a few minutes left, but I want us to leave today thinking about what is it what is it that I can do to make medicine kinder and safer from the role of a patient advocate? And so, Carol, I'm going to start with you first this time around because I have uh, uh, had you uh, is the third each time we've gone around. Carol, what would you, as we are sort of beginning to sort of, we want to gain momentum. We want others to say, I've got a role here. What would you have them think about as they, uh, ponder and reflect on this session today? I would say fight for transparency. Fight to see the numbers. You want to know how many people were harmed in our hospital today or this year or this month. How can we improve? The voices from the people that work in these systems the voices that have a soul to change what they see and they do not agree with, they need to be brave. Be brave enough to stand up and speak out for every patient and every healthcare worker, because if there are things that are happening and there are, they need to be fixed. Don't count on somebody else to do it. You need to stand up and do it no matter what. Carol, I really like that. I really like that. And, and this, I think, is one of the reasons that I was so struck by your comments today. I'm struck by Michael's message because you're going to have tenacity. You're going to go after these things because they're important, but we can do them in socially appropriate ways that are far more effective. And those things make a difference. Susanna, what would you add as we sort of Think about messages that we would want to be sure that those listening will contemplate and reflect on. I think uh, I go I go back to teamwork, to the discipline, multidisciplinary teams, and um, I think it was one of your prior um, presidents who said, "Yes, we can." Uh, mm -hmm. So yes, we can uh, make changes in our healthcare. Um, uh, no matter where it happens uh, in, uh, in any country, anywhere, um, patients and their advocates should participate in the definitions in or and the, those measures implemented to prevent it to happen again. Susanna, I feel so strongly about this, and this links back to Sue's comments. You know, the the, the commitment here has got to be to make medicine kinder and safer, but we do that by making it be more respectful to the real participants, patients and families who see and observe things. The combination of data, Carol's point, with stories to make it real, Carol's point. These things are required to make a difference and to influence and to influence and influence. Sue, what would you add? I would go back to something I already said, but I would strengthen um, 
humility. I really think the healthcare system, our leaders, our clinicians um, need to invite, you know, the patient community in our knowledge and have the humility to accept that maybe we've got some solutions that they haven't thought of. And um, so that's, that's, you know, be humble and learn from us, learn from patients. I mean, there is so much that happens that we know that we experience the outcomes that we have that simply don't get captured. So engage in developing mechanisms and reporting uh, tools and other ways that, that our voice can get heard. Because right now the patient voice is still quite absent in, in really improvement efforts. The last thing I would say is um, be a Pollyanna. Um, you know, dream big. I love the, the saying by Daniel Burnham, make no little plans where they have no magic to stir men's blood. Don't think small, think big. If a Pollyanna from Boise, Idaho can be part of guideline develops and changes and um, new standards, then others certainly can. Thank you for that. I, you know, it is this notion that as people sit and reflect on this session, there is so much to be done. Wherever we have humans engaged in any kinds of activities, we have opportunities, uh, as I say, to do more better. I know that's not grammatically correct, but we do. And we don't do it as long as we sit around just pointing out problems. The issue is it's about building solutions in collaboration because we do have systems that make it hard for people to do the right thing. It makes it hard for patients and families coming into our health systems to get the care they need. Real leaders are committed to fixing that, but real leaders also understand that the human element is important. And I talk all the time about accountable professionals because we do have accountability, but that accountability should start with listening and that doesn't occur, Sue, without humility. And so those things go together and I think are great drivers of our safety. Right. Now, we have about 30 seconds apiece left. Carol, in 30 seconds, what else would you like to share today? Susanna, get ready. And Sue, you'll get the last word. Get involved. Whoever you are, whatever position you have, find a way to get on a committee or get on an HAI advisory committee, or wherever you are, get a vote and a voice and make it focused on the patients. Because patient safety means patients are going to live and thrive, and so will you. So get on a committee or a board or a panel and make your voice heard. Carol, thank you. Susanna, what would you add? 30 seconds. Could uh, culture change changes if we, uh, it happens if we have the will and if we sit at the same table. Go. That's right. And Susanna, I'm going to leave 15 seconds of silence here, which we never do, because I want people to think about that. And then Sue. But would you so I'm going to close with something that Carol opened with, and that was the term hope um, and believing, you know, starting out on your projects, believing you will be successful. You know, when we moms changed the standard of care for jaundice management, a reporter said to me, Mrs. Sheridan, I'll bet you and the other moms never imagined that you would change the standard of care and jaundice management. And I said, oh, yes, we did. So hope, you know, let us all join this revolution. And there's this great saying that, you know, let's start this revolution of hope and not despair because hope is a really powerful mechanism. And I hate to say that sometimes it takes a while to see it, the results of it. And I do not want to miss the length of time that all of our panelists have been engaged in these efforts. And even though they don't come easy, it's especially why we have to all get engaged and stay engaged. And so 
Sue, is the work finished yet? No. Oh gosh. <laughs> you're still you're still revising. Carol, is the work still is it finished yet? No. No. And Susanna, is it finished? The answer is no. Never. <laughs> so let's leave this session today and get back to work. That's right. Sounds good. Thank, Thank everyone and go out and do good work. Make medicine kinder and safer. At Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, we are committed to safe patient care. Our patients come to us with a sacred trust that will do no harm. To deliver on safety, we must be resilient and reliable no matter the circumstances. That is what highly reliable organizations do. They are successful because they hire to fit, anticipate mistakes and error-proof their environment and design all of their systems and processes incorporating these five principles into their operations. They have a preoccupation with failure, sensitivity to operations, a reluctance to simplify, commitment to resilience, and deference to expertise. In our organization, we have been intentionally designing for reliability and continue to refine our leadership capability and error-proofing skills to improve quality and safety. With our preoccupation with failure, we have established organizational structures and ongoing monitoring systems, really enhancing our ability to detect emerging problems or drift from strong performance, allowing us to lean in quickly to course correct before conditions exacerbate. We've incorporated visual boards, daily management systems, and leadership routines that build in daily sensitivity to operations so leadership can support, mitigate, as well as reward safety activities and behaviors. We are reluctant to simplify the answers to why things happen and are fostering what we call a questioning attitude, as well as enhanced our safety event evaluation systems to assure that we dig deep to understand the root causal factors and then mitigate incorporating human factor science and the highest levels of our hierarchy of controls into the design of interventions that make it easy to do the right thing and prevent harm. Our commitment to resilience assures that we create standard work, protocols, guidelines, and policies that when strictly adopted, assure we have consistent, safe, and quality outcomes. We also recognize that to err is human and are currently deploying a common set of error proofing and peer coaching tools that will prevent cognitive error and arm our staff with a common language to respectfully coach a colleague to do the right thing. Most importantly, we embrace deference to expertise by deferring to those most knowledgeable when it comes to finding and fixing our problems and including those that are closest to the work in the identification and solutioning of issues. Our patients and family members play an important role in this process. We invite them to participate in event investigations, shift nurse knowledge exchanges, and in designing system change or novel care pathways. These HRO principles combined create a collective mindfulness around quality and safety. Highly reliable organizations are in a constant state of anticipation rather than reaction, and they position themselves with the ability to quickly contain and minimize risk before things exacerbate. We are proud to be recognized by the Patient Safety Movement Foundation for high reliability. However, we recognize that high reliability is not a destination, but rather a continuous journey of improvement and optimized safety.